Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'll show you a horror fantasy film, Creep Show, Part 1. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins with an angry father scolding his young son about reading a comic book called Creep Show. He calls the comic book a piece of trash, and he even slaps his son. The son begs his father not to take the comic book away, but the father still throws it in the trash can. As the father reclines in the living room, the son sits upstairs in his room, wishing that his father will rot in hell. Lightning flashes and thunder echoes. The light illuminates a skeleton wearing a hood, floating outside the boy's window. It's the same skeleton depicted in the comic book, whose name is Creep. The creep beckons to the boy. The first story begins with an elegant rich aunt welcoming her nephew, niece, and niece's husband into the grand family home. They tell the husband the story about their matriarch who had killed her own father. The father was an abusive man who thought the worst of everybody. One day, the matriarch fell in love with an older man and planned to live with him away from her father. Afraid of losing his daughter, the father killed her lover and made it look like a hunting accident. Consumed with rage, the matriarch fed her father with cake on Father's Day and killed him with a marble ashtray. The aunt helped the matriarch cover up the murder, and they all split the father's wealth equally. On the same day every year, the matriarch returns to the estate and visits her father's grave. Usually, she would spend one hour there, and then she would sit down for a meal with the aunt and her nephew and niece. It's Father's Day again. The niece's husband hears a car screech down the driveway. It is the matriarch arriving. She gets out of her car and slowly approaches her father's grave inside the family cemetery. She is drunk and hurls insults at her father. She spills some of the liquor on her father's gravestone. Suddenly, her father rises up from the grave as a maggot infested skeleton. He proceeds to kill her, while still screaming about wanting his father's day cake. Back in the house, the aunt and the others are waiting for the matriarch. The niece starts dancing to a loud song on the radio with her husband, but he grows curious about the matriarch and goes outside so he can meet her. The husband goes to the family cemetery and discovers the matriarch's lifeless body in front of the gravestone. He trips and falls down, and the father uses telekinesis to make the gravestone collapse on top of the husband, crushing him to death. The father then makes his way to the house. He kills the cook and hides her body. Meanwhile, the aunt grows impatient, so she enters the kitchen, looking for the cook. She notices the muddy footprints leading to the door. The father snaps her neck. Eventually, the niece and nephew notice that many people are going missing. They walk toward the kitchen, and when they open the door, the father stands before them, bearing the aunt's head on a platter covered with frosting and lit candles. He greets the terrified pair with a happy Father's Day. The second story begins on a remote farm. A meteor lands on the side of the land. A simple-minded farmer sees the meteor and touches it with his finger. It begins to glow a bright red. The farmer gets the idea to sell the meteor to the local college for some money. He gets a bucket of water and douses the meteor with it to cool it down. But the meteor cracks open and a glowing blue liquid spills out of it. He now thinks that the college will not accept the meteor anymore and he can't make money from it. The farmer decides to retire for the night and aims to try to glue the two halves of the meteor together tomorrow morning. He sits down to watch TV. Hours later, he discovers that the hand he used to touch the meteor is now covered in strange green grass. He now thinks that he will have to go to the doctor and his hand will end up getting amputated. As time passes, the green grass spreads all over the farmer's body and all the belongings he touched. He also begins to itch all over. He looks in horror as his entire farm is now covered in green grass. The farmer panics and tries to calm himself down by mixing orange juice with vodka. He sits down on his couch again and falls asleep. The next morning, he wakes up with even more green grass covering him and his house. He decides to take a bath. In the mirror, he sees the ghostly apparition of his dead father, who warns him that the substance from the mikir wants water. The apparition disappears, and the tub glows brightly in the farmer's eyes. He dives into the water. More time passes, and the farmer has now completely transformed into a grass-covered creature. He loses his will to live, and grabs a shotgun. He points it at his head, and prays that just this once, he will have the luck to end his life finally. He successfully kills himself. The reporter on the news announces that more rain is coming to the area soon, implying that the alien grass will just continue to spread. The third story begins with an older millionaire visiting a younger man named Harry in his apartment. It turns out that the millionaire is the husband of Becky, Harry's lover. Harry is unperturbed about the millionaire's presence, and he promises that it will be a quick and easy divorce, because Becky does not want anything from the millionaire. She only wants to be away from him. The millionaire jovially says that he is particularly possessive about the things he owns. 
Disturbingly, he casually fiddles with Harry's VCR set and even recommends that he cleans the cartridges. Harry tells the millionaire to leave them alone, but the millionaire pulls out a recording of Becky begging Harry for help. He insinuates that he has Becky captive somewhere, and if Harry doesn't come with him, she will die. Harry has to go with the millionaire. They head to his isolated beach house. While walking, Harry sees a burial mound on the shore. Thinking that Becky's there, he rushes to it. But it turns out that it is empty. The millionaire then pulls out his gun and forces Harry to get in the hole. Harry reluctantly climbs inside, and the millionaire buries him in sand up to his chin, with only his head sticking out. The millionaire leaves and returns sometime later with a TV set and some wiring. He plays the live footage of Becky on the other side of the beach, also buried with her head sticking out. She is screaming in pain as the tide slowly washes over her. She is now coughing as the water starts to drown her. On Harry's side, the tide will be coming in soon too. The water even short circuits the TV set and the last thing that Harry sees is a dying Becky uttering his name. The millionaire returns to his beach house and gleefully watches the footage of both Becky and Harry being tortured by the tide. At this time, the waves now covered his head and persistently assault him. Harry turns to the camera and vows that he will have his revenge on the millionaire. Of course, the millionaire doesn't think much about this promise. The tide finally comes in and Harry is completely submerged in the water. Hours later, the millionaire comes back to the spot where he left Harry, but Harry's body is nowhere to be found. He just simply assumes that the current pulled Harry's body out into the water. That night, alone in his beach house, the millionaire hears Becky's voice whispering his name. The millionaire assures himself that both Becky and Harry are gone, and he is all alone in the house. He also checks his security cameras and confirms that no one has trespassed into his property. But Becky and Harry appear inside his house. They have returned from the dead as seaweed-covered corpses, moaning the millionaire's name. The millionaire pulls out his gun and tries to shoot them, but even bullets cannot stop the sea ghosts. The millionaire runs inside his bedroom and barricades himself, but when he turns around, Becky and Harry are there. They mock the millionaire, and he begins to laugh hysterically. As their revenge, the sea ghosts bury the millionaire in the sand up to his chin. The two lovers then disappear together in the surf, leaving the millionaire behind to slowly die like they did. They also leave a camera behind to record his death. As the waves engulf him, the millionaire screams that he can hold his breath for a long time. The fourth story begins at a faculty party in a small college. A professor is hosting the gathering and is socializing with his guests, which includes his colleague and best friend Henry and Henry's nagging wife Billy. Billy is perpetually drunk and constantly insults her husband in public. During the party, the professor gets a call from a janitor saying that he found an old crate marked with the date 1834, hidden under a basement staircase. He meets the janitor and they retrieve the large and dusty crate. Back at the party, the drunk Billy once again belittles Henry in front of all his colleagues. He imagines that he has a gun, and he shoots her in front of everyone. He also fantasizes that everyone is glad that his annoying wife is gone. The professor and the janitor love the crate to a nearby lab, so they can open it. However, once they open it, an enormous monkey-like creature with razor-sharp teeth pounces on the janitor and kills him. The professor runs away in shock and encounters a student. He blubbers about the mysterious creature and asks the student to call the police. But out of curiosity, the student instead goes to the lab. He sees the blood on the floor, but the crate and the janitor are missing. He begins to suspect that the professor is the one who killed the janitor. They discover that the crate is back in its spot under the basement staircase. Blood is pouring out of it, and the janitor's bloody shoe is lying nearby. The professor cautions the student not to go any nearer, but the student reaches out to get the shoe, because he wants to measure the bite mark. He also inches closer to the crate, and the creature attacks him too. The professor runs away and heads to Henry's house. He tells him about the horrifying creature in the crate. Henry suddenly gets the idea to use the creature to get rid of his nagging wife. He drugs the professor's drink, so he would lose consciousness. He then leaves a letter for his wife, telling her that the professor had made unwanted advances on a female student, and it resulted in a mess. He begs his wife to help him sort out the situation. Henry deliberately acts like he is helpless to stroke his wife's ego, since she is always calling him an idiot. The wife goes home and sees the letter, cackling because once again, her husband is fumbling around like an idiot. Meanwhile, Henry cleans up the blood in the lab, so Billy wouldn't suspect anything. She arrives and is about to head to the lab, but he intercepts her, telling her that the female student is hiding under the basement staircase, and Billy should get her out. They step inside the space, and the monster reaches out and bites Billy's neck. With both shock and relief, Henry stumbles into the hallway. 
When the creature is done devouring his wife, Henry locks the crate with a heavy metal chain. He later drives to a quarry and dumps the crate into the water and watches as it sinks to the bottom. Later, the professor wakes up in Henry's house, and Henry explains everything to him. Henry also assures him that there is no evidence of the deaths, and they can continue to live their lives. The professor asks Henry what if the creature manages to escape, but Henry just laughs, saying that it would be impossible to escape the chain wrapped by him heavily. However, it turns out, deep down in the quarry, the creature has already managed to unlock the chains. The fifth story begins with a rich old hermit, living inside his supposedly germ-proof apartment. He has a terrible phobia of germs, so he is obsessed with keeping his apartment squeaky clean and germ-free. But he has been seeing cockroaches around his apartment lately, and it is driving him crazy. He is distracted by a call from one of his employees, informing him that his company has acquired majority stock of another company in a hostile takeover. The employee also adds that the owner of that company committed suicide. The cold-hearted hermit does not feel sympathy for the dead man. Once again, the hermit sees cockroaches around his apartment. He tries to exterminate them with bug spray, but more and more keep popping up. Later, the widow of the company owner calls him. She lashes out at him for being so callous and profit-driven, and tells him that he is the cause of her husband's death. The hermit then finds cockroaches in his food processor too. Disgusted, the hermit forces the superintendent to order the handyman to get an exterminator to the building, or else the hermit will get him fired. The hermit opens a box of cereal and finds even more cockroaches inside. The handyman arrives and converses with the hermit from outside the door, since the hermit is a recluse. The handyman informs him that he is called a fumigation service. Suddenly, a blackout occurs and the apartment is plunged into darkness. Waves of cockroaches engulf the hermit's place. He flees inside his hermetically sealed panic room, and he taunts the bugs by saying that they will never get inside. But when he turns around, the widow's voice echoes around his place, saying that she hopes he will die. The blanket begins to move around as bugs emerge from under the covers and attack him. The hermit dies, and his body lies on the floor. When morning comes, the handyman returns and calls for him. As the handyman curses the hermit for being so crotchety, cockroaches emerge from his body. Back in the suburbs, the garbage men collect the trash from the son's house. They see the comic books inside the trash, and they flip through it. They notice an ad for a voodoo doll, but the order form has already been cut out of the page. The men comment that someone must have already bought it. Inside the house, the father is yelling for the son to go down for breakfast. He complains of having a stiff neck. Upstairs, the son is holding the voodoo doll he ordered, and is gleefully pricking it with a needle. He is the one causing his father pain. He plunges the needle again and again, and laughs at his father's fate. The movie ends with the creep holding the comic book and grinning wickedly. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.